Okay, welcome to uh, St. Catherine of Siena Church, St. Vincent, St. Catherine of Siena Parish, uh, for another Midday Retreat with the Mystics. And we'll continue on next month again with the third Saturday of February, and we'll look at Francis de Sales uh, next month. So you can get ready for him, especially the treatise on divine love. Um, today, the mystic we'll look at is Meister Eckhart. And I'll just give some quick uh, biographical information before we start with prayer and get into the talk uh, more directly in our theme. You know, I always count on, you can always look, at, look up Eckhart and, uh, on Wikipedia and find general information about him. So I don't want to waste time uh, on that. I want to get to the heart of the matter, which is how he can be helpful for us in the spiritual life. Right? That's, that's why you're here, to learn from him in your spiritual lives. Uh, that's why I'm here. <laughs> um, so, okay, Meister Eckhart, uh, 1260 to 1327 or 28. Um, and I'll, I'll call my talk a, a critical appreciation. You know, until just recently, I would have emphasized critical, uh, but now, yeah, it's critical, but uh, it's, it's more of an appreciation. Uh, just this last time I went through some of his uh, writings and started to get into his complete works, his complete sermons. So now you can get in one volume 100 of his authentic sermons. Scholars are still debating. There might be 20 or 25 more they consider authentic. But this is the most you can get in one volume now. It just came out in 2007. Um, so that's really helpful. And, you know, the advantage of reading the complete sermons is you get to see the whole Eckhart and not just what other people have, which sermons they have chosen out of him. So I've discovered some sermons in here where he's kind of working as um, more of a classical Dominican like we might think of uh, today. You know, making the right distinctions, saying things clearly, uh, of a concern for orthodoxy, and really getting his point across in a straightforward way. And so I think the good way to interpret him is to take those uh, periods of clarity, those sermons that are clear, and other sermons that are a little like, oh wow, what does he mean by that? <laughs> uh, to interpret it in an orthodox way. And I do you know, believe that would be Eckhart's own uh, desire for us. So as you may know, he was uh, condemned, some of his propositions and his teachings were condemned during his life. They were uh, suspicious of him and his teachings. And uh, before he died, he wrote a statement of faith. You know, some of these um, statements that were brought up against him, he said, well, I didn't quite say that. And that's part of the issue, too, is his sermons, you know, they weren't written by his own hand. They were copied by someone in the congregation, and he never, like, read through it on his own afterwards. So that can be some of it, but that doesn't explain all of it. But anyways, he says um, he submits to the judgment of the church, and he intends to be Orthodox and Orthodox Catholic, and anything not in line with it, he submits to the church. And I take that to be his heartfelt desire, so to read him in line with the tradition, uh, I think is the right way to read him. You know, other people come to Eckhart with um, different desires or different perspectives, and so they can highlight other things, and certainly some of his statements, you know, taking just one statement, out of, you know, context of his whole corpus, uh, you can do a lot of funny things with it. Um, and he is very inconsistent. He's very inconsistent in, in what he says. Um, from one place to another. Um, and so to read him in line with the tradition, and I think, you know, some people who are, let's say, writing like a history in Christian spirituality or mysticism, yeah, you might, you'll highlight an Eckhart that's distinctive about him. You're not going to highlight what he has in common with everyone else. So that can kind of give a distorted picture of that part as well, if you're just highlighting what's distinctive about him. Which, I mean, which makes sense to do if you're writing a whole long history of every mystic who ever lived. You're going to point to the distinctive aspects of each mystic. And for me, 
John Towler, Blessed Henry Suso, I find them to be very trustworthy. They were Eckhart's disciples. And they found Eckhart to be a spiritual master. They thought of him as a man of great holiness. Um, and they're very clear in their attempt to remain orthodox while taking the best of what's in our Eckhart and running with them. And they're original thinkers themselves. We already had a midday retreat on both of them in the past couple years. Um, but Meister Eckhart was their master. Blessed Henry Suso uh, has a vision where he sees Meister Eckhart in heaven. Take that for what, what that's worth, but I, I believe it. Um, John Tyler speaks about him being misunderstood. But these men whom I trust wholeheartedly, Tyler and Blessed Henry Suso, they trust Eckhart, so I trust Eckhart. <laughs> And I will say, reading his sermons more recently, so I went up to the Dominican Monastery of Nuns in North Guilford, Connecticut, and gave them classes on Eckhart. So I returned to him uh, about a month and a half ago and just began to discover new sermons that I hadn't read before that kind of opened my eyes to another side of, of Eckhart. Uh, and that helped me to appreciate the whole. And so, um, so yeah, critical appreciation, but yeah, now the accent's more on appreciation say at this point. So, all right, so without further ado, let's uh, start with prayer and, um, yeah, enter into the depths of God. And I, you know, if you want a title for this talk besides critical appreciation, um, it'll be Finding God in All Things. I think that's really what Meister Eckhart helps us with, to find God in all things. His, um, just really quick before we get started again. So you have complete works of Eckhart, uh, Maurice uh, O.C. Walsh. And it used to be like three or four volumes, but thankfully Bird McGinn brought it all together in one volume and did a little editing here or there. Um, and then I think the best introduction to Eckhart is Oliver Davies' The Mystical Tradition of Northern Europe. I mean, that's the subtitle. Uh, the main title is God Within. God Within, the mystical tradition of Northern Europe, Oliver Davies. I think that's the best account of Eckhart and his thinking. And he also edited and translated the Penguin Classics volume on Meister Eckhart. So this is the volume I started with when I was in college. So I first read Eckhart this in, I don't know, I don't I forget how old I am. Uh, 2002 or three or something, 2003 probably, um, 2004, uh, read, got into Meister Eckhart uh, through this volume, and so this is a good place to start as well, but, you know, to get the complete sermon is even better. And then Bernard McGinn in his uh, great series on uh, mysticism in the Western Church has a great volume on the harvest of mysticism in medieval Germany, and he treats in this volume Eckhart's uh, Henry Suso and John Tyler, and a great chapter on Albert the Great and the Neoplatonic metaphysics of flow. And he shows how Meister Eckhart is much more a, a follower of Albert the Great's metaphysics than Thomas Aquinas. You know, Eckhart has a great respect for Aquinas. Aquinas was made the official theologian of the Dominicans in 1309. I remember Eckhart dies in 1328 or 29, or 27 or 28. Um, so he quotes Eckhart um, nine times, I believe, but he, his metaphysics is much more shaped by another Dominican master and great, Albert the Great. I mean, just to note, too, that Meister Eckhart, he wasn't like on the fringes of Dominican life. He was well integrated into Dominican life. He was a brilliant scholar and professor. He held the head chair of theology, the University of Paris, two different terms, which the only other person who can claim that is uh, Thomas Aquinas. And Eckhart was very respected by his Dominican brothers. He was elected prior of a big priory more than once. He was provincial of a whole province of Dominicans. Um, and I don't know if you know Dominicans, but... <laughs> I'm sure they weren't that much different than we are today, but we can be pretty critical of our own. 
So if like Meister Eckhart was like just faking it, if he wasn't like a real mystic and just kind of faking it with all this, or if they saw him as just kind of this wild horse or something, <laughs> they would never have elected him as prior. And even more than that, they would have never elected him as provincial. But no, he held responsibilities within the order and important teaching positions. So a brilliant man uh, and well respected. And so to, you know, that says a lot to his credit as well and how to read him. Okay, so let's, let's dive into this. We'll turn first to our Blessed Mother as we pray the Angelus together, just past the noon hour. The angel of the Lord declared unto Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, and the word was made flesh. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Pray for us, O Holy Mother of God. That we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. Let us pray. For forth we beseech thee, O Lord, thy grace into our hearts. That we, to whom the incarnation of Christ thy Son was made known by the message of an angel, may his passion and cross be brought to the glory of his resurrection. Through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, we want to love you with our whole mind, heart, soul, and strength. Help us to recollect, recollect our minds and hearts. To search deep within, where you dwell, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in our souls as in a temple, through grace. Help us to find that deep place, that ground of the soul, where you hold us in existence, where you continue to communicate your life and love to us. Help us, Lord, to meet you in that, that dark, secret place in the depths of our heart. And to draw forth from that place your life, your grace, your love for a world so hungry, so thirsting for you. Help us to find you throughout our day-to-day -day lives and all that we do. Through faith, through hope, through love. We ask about this in the holy and saving name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Holy Father, St. Dominic. Pray for us. St. Catherine of Siena. Pray for us. St. Vincent Fair. Pray for us. St. Albert the Great. Pray for us. Blessed Henry Suso. Pray for us. John Tyler. Pray for us. And today we will say Meister Eckhart. Pray for us. St. Joseph. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You know, we're used to looking at life used to looking at reality from a creaturely perspective. That kind of makes sense, right? We're creatures after all. <laughs> and so we're naturally, spontaneously going to approach things from our perspective, of that of creatures. Now imagine if you were to live more and more radically, uh, not from a creaturely perspective, but from God's perspective. And what if approaching reality radically from God's perspective also meant uh, from an eternal perspective. Right? The eternal now is very important for Meister Eckhart. Not just Eckhart Tolle, <laughs> who arrived some years after him in a different kind of context. Uh, but no, the eternal now, that phrase shows up all the time in Meister Eckhart, the Dominican. And it builds on uh, what St. Thomas says about eternity. What's eternity? You know, sometimes people think of eternity as just like a really long <laughs> timeline, a really long succession of, of time. Well, no. St. Thomas says eternity is the standing now, the nunc stans, 
the nook stands, the nook, the now that's standing, the standing now. The eternal now is every moment gathered up in the present. And that's how God sees life. That's how he sees us. That where, that's where he dwells. He dwells outside of time and eternity where everything's present to him at the same time. So imagine if we lived in that perspective. And that's where my, Meister Eckhart lived. And he spoke out of that perspective, more from God's perspective than the creature's perspective. And that's partly why he was so misunderstood. John Tyler says about Meister Eckhart, there was a master among you and you didn't appreciate him. You didn't understand him because he spoke from out of eternity and you're still too time bound. So that's from John Tyler, one of his great disciples who appreciated Eckhart and I think that does capture something. A way to understand uh, how, to, how to approach Eckhart and some of the things he says. Right, so for Eckhart, living from God's perspective or trying to, right, as much as we can through faith, and it is, you know, part of the task of faith, especially the gift of wisdom that builds on charity. The gift of wisdom sees things from the highest vantage point, from God's own view. Right, I think we appreciate how helpful that can be in life <laughs> so we don't get, like, so caught up in our little kind of uh, scuffles with one another, or when we make uh, mountains out of molehills, so we're all prone to do that, all right? Something that's small, we kind of blow up in our own mind and heart. We get anxious about things we need not get anxious about. Overly anxious, overly concerned. So I think we can appreciate, yeah, the need for more of God's perspective, to see things from that mountaintop, so to speak. And that's where Eckhart tried to live. And that's where he spoke from, right? So what's most fundamental for Meister Eckhart is the life of the Trinity and the Father begetting the Son and the communion of the Holy Spirit. You know, uh, Meister Eckhart very strongly emphasizes God as one, and we can see in that kind of a Neoplatonic influence but it's not just Neoplatonic, it's monotheistic, right? We Christians who believe in the Trinity, we believe in one God, and Eckhart is at pains to bring us to the one God again and again. But there is a place for the three as well, and just as strongly emphasized by Eckhart as the one is the birth of the Son from the Father, radically Trinitarian. Those are kind of the two main things he most returns to when he speaks about God. God as one and the birth of the Son from the Father. So one and, and Trinitarian, his emphases. I remember when I was um, beginning as a young Dominican and I was really liking Eckhart from my studying him in college. And I remember reading uh, an article uh, from Communio. I, lo I love Communio, so don't think it's Communio. But it laid out Eckhart and how, for him, uh, as it says, uh, there's beyond the three persons, there's like a Godhead behind the three persons, beyond them, more radical than, than the three. Right? Which doesn't square with Trinitarian theology. And so that kind of like... That kind of took the, the wind out of my Eckhart sails. <laughs> and I saw the point, and I thought, ah. Um, but, you know, just like I said, picking up the complete sermons and seeing sermons that, okay, this article didn't refer to, uh, there are places in here where he just as radically emphasizes the three. And he says the Godhead he said, does that really get passed on from the Father to the Son, the Godhead? And he says, yes, the root of the Godhead is what the Father begets and hands over to the Son as he begets the Son. So it's not like the Godhead is something more foundational or transcendent for Eckhart. The three is just as transcendent and all-surpassing. The Father begets the root 
of the Godhead passes it on to the, the son as he gives him everything. So anyways, um, so Eckhart, you know, he's a very dialectic thinker. You know, a lot of with the mystery of God, that's kind of what we're stuck with on a practical level. You know, think about like grace and free will. Right? With grace, we touch on the mystery of predestination. And it's hard to wrap our minds around how God's grace can elevate our freedom, can move us without doing violence to our freedom. It's predestined grace, which is biblical, Ephesians 1, Romans 8. It's hard to square that in our minds. So as preachers, as people who speak about God, we're left with this kind of dialectical situation, meaning we emphasize one side of the mystery sometimes and then emphasize the other side of the mystery at other times. Right? You know, the preacher, you can only say so much in one sermon. So you might hear some of my sermons and say, wow, he's really preaching about freedom. Well, what about grace? You know, uh, has he turned into a Pelagian, a semi-Pelagian with this emphasis on freedom? Uh, other times you might hear me preach and you're like, oh my gosh, like he sounds like a Calvinist or something. With this emphasis on grace and God's grace going before us, preventing grace like in our opening prayer for the Feast of the Solemnity of the Immaculate Conception, prevenient grace, grace that goes before us, even our freedom. And so with the mysteries of God, with the mysteries of Christian life and our life with God, we are stuck sometimes, right? <laughs> uh, just emphasizing one side of the mystery, emphasizing another. Uh, or you don't do that, you just stay with like, saying the same clear doctrinal statement over and over and over and over again. Um, and so, you know, we have the same thing with God as one and God as three. Some sermons you'll hear, and there's an emphasis on the three persons. And then we need, like Eckhart's challenge, to return to the one. So we, we don't fall into a, um, a tritheism, even like without meaning to. You know, just kind of a level of imagination or something. Um, and so Eckhart lives from God's perspective as much as he can, and what's most fundamental for him is the Father begetting the Son. The Father uttering the Word from all eternity in the communion of the Holy Spirit. And let's think about that Word. Let's appreciate that. Right? There's nothing in creation that's more than that Word. You know, it's a little embarrassing, but um, I have all these videos on the Dominican House of Prayer YouTube channel. And a good lay Dominican says, you know, if you want, I can change all, I can turn all of those videos into transcripts. So you have text of them, like a computer generated text. I'm like, oh, wow. You know, of course you have to read, still edit it, but I thought, wow, okay, I said, you know, if you want to do that, go for it. And so we started with one, and then uh, before Christmas, said, oh, here's a Christmas gift. And he did everything uh, on the Dominican House of Prayer. <laughs> All my talks, he turned into text files, and he says it's just under two million words. <laughs> oh gosh! <laughs> oh gosh! I'm long winded. Sorry about that. <laughs> so that was a little embarrassing, right? But those two million words, it's all about one word, right? The word as he's uttered by the Father contains all those two million words and more. Right? Anything that's good, that's true, that's beautiful is contained in that word uttered by the Father. It's contained in the Father begetting the Son and more, you know? Right? There's nothing in creation that's outside of God. That There's nothing in creation that draws from a source outside of God. There's nothing in creation that's true, good, and beautiful. That's not a reflection of what is in God in a greater fullness. Right? The only exception here is sin, of course. And sin is that lack of being. It's like um, the blindness of the eye. It's a lack. But And so Eckhart dwells in that place of the Father begetting the Son. And guess what? Like all of creation is in God's mind for all eternity. Right? Think about God's eternity, where we started, where Eckhart dwells. God from all eternity has known us. Right? Before you were created, he knew you. He knew your life. He knows your ending point in heaven. He knows what he created you to be. 
right? And scriptures bear witness to this. Think of Romans uh, 8, uh, 28 and onwards. For God's love, no. Um, we know that all things work together for good, for those called according to God's purpose, for those who love God, for those whom he foreknew, he also pre predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that the son might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he called, and th th those who he foreknew, he predestined, those he predestined, he chose, those he chose, he justified, those he justified, he glorified. So all that is in God's mind from all eternity. And he creates us to be the, in the image of his son. Right? The sun is that perfect, like, bright white light. And we, as its images, are kind of like that spectrum of colors that's refracted by the prism. It takes all of us, like, imitating, you know, certain aspects of Christ. You know, each person has, like, a mystery of Christ that they live out in a special way. But your whole purpose is to be an image of the image of God, an image of, of, of the sun. So when the Father is begetting the Son, speaking His Word from all eternity in the communion of the Holy Spirit, He knows you in that speaking of that Word. You're contained in that proceeding forth of the Word from the Father's heart. And Eckhart loves to dwell in that place. And our being begotten as adopted sons and daughters in the Son also shares in that eternal begetting of the Father as he begets the eternal Son. We're there in the mind and heart of God, in the eternal mind and heart of God. We're there from like the beginning of our life to like where God sees us in glory in heaven as it's present to him now as well. So Eckhart loves to dwell in that place of the Son being begotten by the Father and finding everything in that place. What we're meant to be. So that means that we can seize like what God has created us to be for all eternity, what we will be in heaven for all eternity, we can like seize upon in faith and hope. And having that conviction that that is our true selves helps us to live it out. Helps us to live it out. You know, we're really good as, as a church now to talk a lot about our identity in Christ. Right? Who am I truly? Well, it's who I am in Christ. An adopted son of God, an adopted daughter of God. I'm a brother of Christ. I'm a temple of the Holy Spirit. I'm the light of the world. I'm the salt of the earth. Not because I'm so great, but because that's what God has made me in Christ. That's truly who I am. And however short I may fall of that ideal in this life, through sin, through struggling, as long as I keep on going, that image, that perfect image that God has of me, intends for me, will be accomplished on the last day. And in God's mind and heart, it's like already there. And as I seize hold of that, like I begin to live that out more and more. You know, it's also the biblical thinking and like including passages like Ephesians 1. 3 through 14, in our predest predestination in Christ. Being confident that every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places has been poured out upon us in Christ, and we've been washed clean, transformed by the blood of Christ, and we've been given everything the Son's been given, claiming that in faith helps us to live that out. Gregory of Nyssa, I think it's in what it means to be a Christian, or maybe perfection, but he says, uh, we become what we believe our origin to be. What we believe our principle, our origin to be, that is what we become. Right? So someone who grows up and like thinks he's trash or something, thinks he's nothing, he's not going to amount to anything, often that's what happens, right? We become what we believe our beginning to be. Now that, that's the word that Gregor of Nyssa used, Arche, Arche. It's the same beginning, uh, in the beginning was the word. And Arche can mean, mean beginning, it can mean principle, it can mean foundation, it can mean origin. We become what we believe our origin, our beginning, our principle to be. 
And so, yeah, if you think you're, you're, you're trash, that's often what happens, unfortunately. But if you claim in faith that you're an adopted, beloved daughter of God, that God has an important plan in your life, that you're righteous in Christ, that you're, you're made to love others, pour out your life for others like Christ did on the cross, you believe that, you believe that that's a gift you receive in your identity in Christ, well, then you live that out. You're more prone to live that out. So I see Eckhart's emphasis on finding ourselves in eternity in that begetting of the Son from the Father where we're contained in a way. Him finding us there helps us to live that out. And that's his purpose. Very similar to you know, what we're good at today. Focus on your identity in Christ. Live out that gift that's been given you. And in Eckhart's time, it's very much still an Augustinian world. Yeah, that's not a bad thing. St. Augustine's great. And so they love to think about the eternal archetypes in the Platonic tradition. They love to think about that in terms of God's ideas. So the forms in Plato, that becomes ideas in the mind of God. And they love to play with the idea, you know, in God, there's nothing other than God. Ideas in God's mind are God. <laughs> they are God-like from a, a certain, you know, think of the prism, refracting light, and like a, a limited <laughs> amount of that. Um, like that's God's idea of you from all eternity, the perfect image of you. It's already contained in God, and it is God. Right? And so Eckhart is going to play with that to give you confidence that God became man, that man might become God. Like a lot of the church fathers say, uh, Gregory of Nazianzus and others. And Eckhart is clear, I mean, this is not, I was very happy, you know, a month and a half ago to find a sermon where Eckhart says clearly, what the Son is by nature, we are by grace. What the Son is by nature, we are by grace. That's perfectly orthodox teaching. So when he says things like, you are the Son, and being begotten from the Father, being adopted as sons and daughters of God, you are the Son, I hear that also here in the back of my mind when he said uh, elsewhere. <laughs> what the Son is by nature, you are by grace. And he loves to say, Eckhart loves to say, everything the Father has given his Son, he intends for us. He intends for us. And in fact, I mean, John Paul II says the exact same thing. And it's uh, in Catechism. Okay, just trust me with this. <laughs> it's from Redemptoris Hominis. And uh, John Paul II says, What Christ has is everybody's possession and is meant for everyone. All the riches that Christ has as the Son of God is, is, is for all of us to claim, to share it, right? We're co-heirs with Christ. And so Eckhart, you know, uses a lot of strong language. You are the son. There's only one son. And to hear him in light of, yeah, what the son is by nature, we are by grace. Whatever the son has is meant for us. You know, one of my classmates, uh, Father James Brett, has just come out with a great book, In the Father's House. It's about life in the Trinity. And in the second or third chapter, he begins by saying, you are Jesus. And he says, you haven't heard that before? You are Jesus. And, you know, and my good classmate, you know, concerned about orthodoxy, <laughs> concerned about, like, not saying the wrong thing. Like, no, he says that. And we understand what he means by that. Yeah, there's a distinction, but no, Christ lives in us. Galatians 2.20. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Christ relives his mystery in, in us. It's like Luis Martinez says, uh, to be Jesus crucified. Not just to be like Jesus crucified, but to be Jesus crucified. We're his body. He's our head. What belongs to the head belongs to the body. To be Jesus crucified. It's like what St. Catherine of Siena says from the beginning of the dialogue. We're called to be another Christ. So these strong statements from Eckhart about us being the Son, 
through our adoption, I hear in the same, the same way. And it's meant to increase our confidence in Christ. Tyler says that what we have in the Son, so he, he comments on one of the Christmas antiphons, a son has been given you. You know, a son is born for us, a son has been given to you. And he says, he's been given to you. He's more truly yours than anything else you own. Right? Whatever you could call most your own, the son is more your own than that. <laughs> more of your possession than that. That's how radical our adoption in the son is. It's a new foundation for our being and existence. And we're still humans. It's uh, not a substantial change. Uh, but it's the new foundation of who we are. And to live from that foundation, it takes a lot of work, right? And we don't just need, like, truth statements. We can know, like, the truth, but it often doesn't, like, sink in. It doesn't often penetrate all through our, our minds and hearts. And so we need some strong language like this. You are the Son. Everything that Christ has is yours. There's no difference between you and Jesus. You are Jesus. Uh, we need that. And we understand it in the proper way. So Eckhart, dwelling in this place of eternity where the Father begets the Son, and he finds everything in that place. Hansers von Balthasar makes a kind of a funny quip about Meister Eckhart, and that, that he, he's taken like every philosophy and melted it together into the birth of the Son from the Father. <laughs> like that's like the center of his way of like thinking through things and the metaphysical center of reality. That's where he lives from, and everything is just kind of uh, from that place. And so when we are, when we're assured of that, and, and by the way, Aquinas says a very similar thing. He speaks about two processions. He speaks about the internal processions in the life of the Trinity, the Son proceeding from the Father, the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son, like we profess in the Nicene Creed every Sunday. And then Aquinas also speaks about the created procession, the, the, the temporal procession of creation. Right? God chooses to create, and that too proceeds from God. And Thomas says that the eternal processions of the divine person, Son and Spirit, the eternal divine processions are the ratio et causa of the temporal processions of creation. Namely, the proceeding of the Son from the Father is the cause and the image, the type, the ratio, the reason, uh, the, the, the shape, the form, so to speak. Uh, the eternal Son being begotten proceeding from the Father is the cause, the type of creation proceeding from God. And of us, moreover, even more so, being begotten in the Son. So Aquinas himself sees that connection. And makes it. And Eckhart wants to really kind of get all, take that for all it's worth. So imagine now that, like Eckhart, you see things from God's perspective in a radical way, from an eternal perspective. And imagine now that you see all of creation in that light. It's not like God is up there and we're here, but the Father is begetting the Son. And distinct from, but within that begetting of the Son by the Father, is everything that happens in this life. Is our being begotten from the Son through grace and our adoption as children of God. And when you have that radical foundation of faith, then it's easier to find God in everything. Not just when you come to church, but in the workplace. And this is a key theme for, for Eckhart. You know, if he says if you can only find God in the church, you, you're, you're only finding God in one mode. And he wants us to find God without mode. He says if you can only find God in the church, you're choosing more the mode than choosing God. Right? If you can only find God in one way, you're choosing more the way than God himself, than the real God. And you're choosing an idol, not the true God, right? Because God surpasses every mode. He surpasses every way. 
And so Eckhart, time and time again, he challenges us to seek God himself beyond modes or ways. You, you might have heard a saying like this, and it, it's based very much on Eckhart kind of thought, is that sometimes we have to leave God for the sake of God. So you're sitting in the chapel, you're having a very consoling time with the Lord. It's so consoling, so good, you're so happy to be there. Uh, but then, you know, someone has a need. Your neighbor is coming, knocking at the door. And you would love to, to stay in front of the tabernacle. But sometimes you have to leave God for the sake of God. You leave this experience of God in the chapel to find God in your neighbor, to find him in that experience. And it's hard for us to do. Which is why we need a breakthrough for that to happen. Which is why we need to kind of force ourselves. You know, the language is obviously a little poetic and, um, you know, it would be a contradiction if you just kind of took it literally. But no, you have to leave God, namely this consoling experience of God, for the sake of God. For what he wants for you. To find more the true and living God and not just the God of your imagination or thoughts. Right? To leave God for the sake of God. And a key theme for Eckhart is the breakthrough. The breakthrough. Where we, we do come to this point where we are able to break through created things to find God in everything. You know, some of his language can sound pantheistic here. But if you hear what he's about and in clearer, in more clear statements, then you can understand the other statements that sound pantheistic. You know, pantheism is like, you know, God is everything. Kind of Hinduism kind of falls into, into that. Um, no, there, there's a clear distinction between creature and creator. But we can find God in everything, except sin, of course. But we can find God in everything, every activity we do. You know, and even in sin, we can find God in the mercy he offers us as we turn to him anew. So Eckhart, you know, paints kind of this brilliant picture of the breakthrough. And so, you know, as a college student, I'm reading that, and, you know, I want that breakthrough. <laughs> I want that breakthrough. And, you know, Eckhart does make it sound sometimes like it's a once, one-time deal, once for all. You got the breakthrough, and then, like, you're, you're set for the rest of your life. Um, you know, almost like um, enlightenment, or like um, awakening, you know, like the Buddha sat under that tree. I'm not getting up until uh, enlightenment comes, right? Um, and so, yeah, I, I've sat under many trees, <laughs> waiting. Waiting for the breakthrough. I'm not moving, Lord, until that breakthrough comes. Um, and uh, it's, I'm glad I did it. I'm glad I did it. Um, but here, here's how I approach Eckhart now on this. And this is how his disciples, uh, they also speak of the breakthrough. Suso and John Teller. But, you know, just like Teresa of Avila, she's given the gift to describe these states of prayer like in vivid colors. And you can be in the same state of prayer that Teresa of Avila describes, and it can be like less vivid, less striking. Like part of her, her gift is to give that, that striking depiction of, let's say, the prayer of quiet. And as you're in that state of prayer, you know, probably be a little more dull or a little more subtle. But her gift is like making it colorful, stark, so you get a sense of it. So I take Eckhart kind of in that way when he talks about the breakthrough. He do, it does sound a lot like it's the once for all type thing, <laughs> um, but he he wants but he want, he wants to give like a, a a sense that there really are breakthroughs that happen in life with God, and there there is really like turning points of like okay I can only find God when I pray in front of the, the blessed sacraments, but if I keep persisting, I can also find Him as I serve my neighbor, and I carry out His task and His will in the world. And that, you know, that's the great thing about Eckhart. You know, the way I started, him wanting to see things from God's perspective and from eternity, you, know, you can get the impression like, oh gosh, he's like so detached from life. 
He's only for the monks. But no, this, this is where Eckhart's great. He wants you to withdraw from the world. He wants you to, to recollect yourself. He wants you to, to enter into the silence and stillness and to find God there in the chapel, in the Blessed Sacrament. And once you're rooted in that disposition of prayer, then to go out into the world and bring that same disposition of heart into the marketplace, into the work you're doing for him. You know, Meister Eckhart at his best, in my opinion, is his talks of instruction. And his talks of instruction number six is like out of this world. It's out of this world. And it helps us to do just this. So I'm going to end with just kind of what that looks like in our life. Um, you know, by the way, like some people, they make comparisons uh, between Eckhart and Zen Buddhism in this way. Because it's also, you know, Zen Buddhism, they want you to like read something in meditation to like an enlightenment, but then not to stop there but then to bring that into the day, your daily life. You know, find God in, in the soup bowl that you're cleaning or something <laughs> after you've, you've found him in deep meditation. So, you know, obviously, you know, so there, you know, okay, there are like little, little parallels there. But I think people can make too much of it, you know, claiming Eckhart as a Buddhist because, you know, Eckhart, for Eckhart, Christ is clearly at the center of everything. And he's, you know, well-integrated Dominican. His life is full of, like, chanting the office, the liturgy of the hours, celebrating mass, preaching, studying, teaching. Um, and so what we get in his sermons about silence and transcending all this, it's within that context of a Christian life and all its fullness. Um, so, yeah, so... Okay, so imagine this, and I think this is... Uh, a situation that we can all relate to. So we wake up in the morning, we have our time of prayer, and we have our great resolutions for the day. You know, yeah, John at work, I'm going to be a little more terrible to him. <laughs> we kind of got in a scuffle the other day, but no, I'm going to do better this time. Okay, I'm going to be more mindful of God throughout the day. Okay, we have all these good resolutions in our time of morning prayer, maybe after morning mass, we're ready to go, right? And then you, you leave the church, and then like by lunchtime, you realize like, oh my gosh, where have I been? <laughs> you find yourself scattered. <laughs> you, you said uh, worse things to John than you've ever said before. <laughs> and you're like, oh gosh, what happened to that good resolution? <laughs> what happened to that good resolution? So like the next morning, you're like, you try harder. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I want to try harder this time. This time it's going to happen. This time it's going to happen. Uh, what do we find? Oh gosh, you hit lunchtime again. You're like, oh my gosh, where is my mind gone? I'm like scattered again. I'm scattered. Right? We can't carry out these good resolutions. And so Eckhart's extreme language about the one is meant for us to help us develop that personal unity. So we can be about the one thing necessary. Soren Kierkegaard, I think, captures it well. He says, he who is not himself a unity is never really anything wholly and decisively. He only exists in an external sense. Right? You know, think about a lot of people in this world who don't have like a unified purpose, who are scattered. And yeah, you never really become anything <laughs> if you're drawn this direction one moment, this direction another moment this direction, like, you're so scattered, you don't really exist fully, you don't become anything. He who is not himself a unity is never really anything wholly and decisively. He only exists in an external sense. And Eckhart's spirituality, his sermons, his writings, the talks of instruction, especially number six, help us to attain this personal unity where we can leave the chapel, be recollected in God, and keep that disposition of recollection throughout the multiplicity of our daily lives, amidst all the activities of our lives to keep that unified disposition, which is nothing other than to love the Lord your God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. 
So Eckhart is famous for his emphasis on unity. And we can say, okay, it's a little Neoplatonic or something. But to appreciate that multiplicity has also such a, a big role in his spirituality. Right? He wants us to enter into that single-minded approach to the Lord, recollect ourselves in the one, God, and bring that unified disposition out to the multiplicity of the world. So Eckhart says, be one then, so that you shall find God. And truly, if you are properly one, then you shall remain one in the midst of distinction. And the multifold will be one for you and shall not be able to impede you in any way. Right? If we're really rooted in the one thing necessary, God, if we're really seeking Him, if we're really intending His glory, the good of souls, the good, if that's truly our heart's single purpose and desire, then the multiplicity of life all becomes one for us. And we find God in it, and we intend God through it and in it. Be one then, so that you shall find God. And truly, if you are properly one, then you shall remain one in the midst of distinction. And the multifold will be one for you, and shall not be able to impede you in any way. So how do we get there? And Eckhart imagines two steps. You know, if we're like never unified, if we're always like scattered, always distracted, even in like the chapel, like we don't have a chance <laughs> in this respect when we go out into the multiplicity of the world. Right? Yeah, so the first step is we have to attain recollection, that unity of mind and heart. And prayer, we need to have time for prayer in the chapel. You need to sit under that tree for a long, 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 long time <laughs> until God grants you the breakthrough. Uh, we need to do that. That's the first step. And then second, rooted there, now you have to bring that unity out to the world, to the multiplicity. And Eckhart says, like, you can't do that by fleeing the world. Right? You, you, you can't bring the one into the, the multifold uh, if you flee the world. So Eckhart says, the first step is that we should have sealed ourselves off internally so that our minds are protected from external images, which thus remain outside and do not unfittingly associate with us or keep our company or find a place to lodge in us. Right? You know, so all those resentful thoughts, all those worries about the future, all those grudges, um, they can't find a place to lodge in our hearts. We need to shake those, shake those free. You know, that takes work. It takes years, okay? Uh, the second step, then, is that neither in our inner images, whether these be representations or things or sublime thoughts, nor in external images or whatever is present to us, should we allow ourselves to be dissipated or fragmented or externalized through multiplicity. We should apply and train all our faculties to these, this end, maintaining our inwardness. Right, and I think we, we like all experience this. Like we can be doing something, even something good, but we can like feel like, like you know, I really wasn't kind of like, really wasn't coming from like my center place. I was kind of scattered as I was caring for mom or I was reaching out to, to someone. Like it wasn't really like my real me. I was scattered when I did that. And you know, it's still good. And you know, perfection hardly ever comes in this life. So we kind of have to just deal with these things. But we, we do know, like, when we're in our center, when we're recollected, and we live from that place, when we preach, teach from that place, when you uh, write your icons from that place, uh, when, <laughs> when you uh, talk to your, your neighbor, your friend from that place, uh, yeah, then real meaningful words start to come out. And then a real depth of relationship develops when you're speaking heart to heart with someone and not from, like, a scattered place. A dissipated, dissipated place. So Eckhart suggests to us, take note of how you are inwardly turned to God when in church or in your cell, 
and maintain the same attitude of mind and heart, preserving it when you go among the crowd into restlessness and diversity. Right? And so find that, that movement of your heart, that spirit as it turns to the Lord. Come to identify that in your prayer time. And recapture that, find that again in the midst of conversation, in the marketplace. You know, you have to, you know, some settings are easier than others. So you have to kind of work with those easier settings at first. You know, we all have situations where <laughs> um, someone in our lives approaches us and, you know, what should take like three minutes to describe or to ask uh, takes this person like 20 minutes. Um, and so, yeah, you listen and you, you, you get the gist then like three minutes into it. Um, and so rather than getting frustrated, the, the other, the next 17 minutes, why doesn't this person hurry up? This person is slowing me down. I've got other things I need to do. Da, 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 da. Well, no. Take that as an opportunity. I want to seek the Lord in the depth of my heart as I listen. I want to pray the Jesus prayer in the depths of my heart. And I think you'll find the more focus we're on praying in our hearts, the more deeply we actually listen. Padre Pio he would pray the rosary when he was hearing confessions. We might say, shame on you, Padre Pio. You should be listening closely to your penitent. And here you are praying the rosary. But think how deeply Padre Pio listened. He saw into people's souls as he prayed the rosary and was focused on God within. Right? So don't fall into this kind of modern way of thinking things. If you choose God, it means you're not choosing your neighbor. <laughs> if you choose God, it means you're, you're choosing your neighbor in a more proper way. You can't see your neighbor as he or she truly is unless you see your neighbor in God. Right? The human person is a monstrance for God. The human person doesn't make sense apart from God radiating forth from their center of so to see your neighbor in any other place than in God, you're not seeing your neighbor truly. And to see your neighbor in God, right, we have to be rooted in prayer. So, you know, find the easier circumstances to work on this. Jesus' prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy. You know, the preacher keeps on preaching and you're kind of like ready to move on. Well, just turn to interior prayer. And so, you know, we need these easier settings to train ourselves. Eckhart says, the real possession of God is to be found in the heart, in an inner motion of the spirit towards him, and striving for him, and not just in thinking about him always in the same way. Right, Eckhart points out that if our finding God depends on our thinking about him always in the same way, well then, once your thoughts disappear, God disappears. <laughs> if it's about like thinking about God in the same way, or like in the meditations you do in the chapel, that's the only way you can find God. But when those thoughts disappear, God's going to disappear too. And obviously that's not the case. And so God is deeper than our thoughts. It's in that movement of the spirit, moving the heart. You know, if you want more advice on like how to live this out, go back to the midday retreat on the Hezekas. I don't forget when it was, maybe about a year ago. And they give more and more advice on how to, to do this. For Eckhart, unified believers are they who, quote, possess God alone, intend God alone, and all things become God for them. You know, blessed Concepcion Cabrera de Armida says that God the Father should be like the lighthouse on the horizon of everything we do. God is the lighthouse we aim for in everything we do, serving our neighbor doing this or that task. God is the lighthouse we're intending, we're striving towards. And Eckhart notes that when you possess God alone, intend God alone, then all things become God for you. Right, not in the pantheistic sense, but in the sense that you find God in all things. Right, and that goes against <coughs> common conception still. Oh, how much do you pray a day? Oh, I, I pray always. You know, I find God in everything. I don't need, like, set times of prayer. 
<laughs> this is not so convincing. <laughs> Unless you, you know, you've established that habit over 50 years or something. You know, so it's kind of paradoxical. To find God in all things, you have to seek God above all things. You have to put God first and above all things in order to paradoxically find Him in all things. It's just the way things are. Um, okay, so here's Eckhart. Again, this is from Talk of Instruction number six. To like enter this place to keep striving. He says, truly this demands hard work. Right? It's hard work and we, we fail. Right? If you want to pray without ceasing, lesson number one is get, get used to starting over again. Because <laughs> we're bad at it. <laughs> We're terrible at it. Get used to failing. Be like, oh my gosh, three hours went. I never even thought about the Lord. I never thought about you, Lord. Um, okay, well, humble yourself. Let's get going again. Brother Lawrence, you know, don't beat yourself up. You know, that, this is where you're left to without God. So you know, get back to God and just keep turning. Right? You know, we love to do things we're good at. And our pride kind of gets in there. So that's the awesome thing with you know, continual prayer. Like none of us are good at it, <laughs> so you can't take pride in it. So like, what's going to keep you going? You know, if you're playing golf, like your pride keeps you going. You get better, better, better. Uh, but like praying without ceasing, like there's nothing to puff up your pride about because you're so bad at it. So the only thing that can keep you going is love, love for the Lord. Right? When you find yourself failing, and you can't like pat yourself on the back. This isn't like a success <laughs> for you. <laughs> when you find yourself in that position, you seek God again. Like, how pure of an act of love is that? It has nothing to do with your ego or succeeding or accomplishing something. Truly, this demands hard work and great dedication and a clear perception of our inner life and an alert, true, thoughtful, and authentic knowledge of what the mind is turned towards in the midst of people and things. This cannot be learned by taking flight. That is, by fleeing from things and physically withdrawing to a place of solitude. But rather, we must learn to maintain an inner solitude regardless of where we are or who we are with. We must learn to break through things, break through, break through things and to grasp God in them, allowing Him to take form in us powerfully and essentially. You know, in the same talk of instruction, he does say, you know, okay, yeah. You know, going to the chapel is, is higher than, like, spinning and, you know, knitting or something. But, um, so he does have, you know, a place for solitude. And we do need to make time for that. But you can't just dwell there if you want to have this breakthrough and find God in all things. The one in the many and the, the multitude. And one last thing which is so like part of Eckhart's seek the one, but don't stay there. Bring the one into the multiplicity. He says that, well, let me put it this way, right? If we, if we stay in the chapel, it's easy for us to shape a God after our own imagination. It's easy for us to read the gospels and focus on the things we like and paint a picture of Jesus that's made according to the image of what we want him to be, and not necessarily the true Jesus. Right? If we're just in the chapel, we can easily paint a picture of God that doesn't line up with reality. And you're choosing the mode of enjoying God in that way rather than God himself. You're choosing the mode more than you're choosing God, I heard it say. So the power of seeking the one and the multiplicity is that it's harder to like just shape things exactly as I want them <laughs> when you're out and about with other people, right? If you're in your chapel, okay, you can arrange things as you want, the flower pot here, I wanna play this music, I'm gonna set the thermostat here. Um, you, know, you don't have perfect control over everything, but you, it's a little more control, but you go out into the world, at work, so much is out of your hands, you're confronted with things uh, that you would rather not confront, and that's actually God wanting to break through, not just in some kind of mode of experience of him, but him as he truly is, 
Right? That's why the MCs love to emphasize not just finding Christ in the poor, but finding Christ in the distressing disguise of the poor. Right? The disfigured face of Christ in his passion. The distressing disguise of the poor. The distressing disguise of God in those circumstances we don't like. And that's why Eckhart's so big on to have that equanimity of soul, to find God in all things, whether on the peak or in the valleys, whether it's something you really love or something that grates against you. To really, truly find God, you have to learn to break through even those unpleasant circumstances to find it there. And then you come into contact more with the true and living God. And you find him, not just in the chapel, but you find him in the stillness of solitude, for sure, in meditation on scripture, uh, gazing at nature. You find him, though, also in the weariness of manual labor. You find him in the daily grind of the office. The sufferings of sickness, you find him there. You find him in the service to the poor, forsaken neighbor at your doorstep. Right? It's only then that the Christian's existence is decisive. It's only then that the multifold has become one for the unified believer. And that's what we press on towards as we keep heading and intending the one thing necessary. Lord, we ask you to uh, draw us after you, awaken us, Lord, to your presence. You are already so close to us. Awaken us, Lord, just how close you are. You're already present throughout our lives, Lord, awaken us to your presence. Help us to find you in your distressing disguises through faith, through hope, and through love. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so we'll take a 10-minute break, and then come back to the Exposition of Blessed Sacrament, and then do some readings from from my heart.
just say a few uh, things while people are coming back. This is kind of like the uncut, uncut version. Um, this, by the way, the classes I gave to the Dominican nuns on Eckhart earlier in the year, they sent me the sound recordings. So there are three classes, uh, maybe 50 minutes, 45 or 50 minutes each. And then I wanted to wait to post them until after this talk tonight. So if you wanted today, if you wanted more Eckhart, go to the Dominican House of Prayer uh, in a week or so, and you'll find three class sound recordings, um, three classes on Eckhart. I wanted to say something about his language. And this is Oliver Davies um, helped me see some things, and then there were some other things that just came, came together. Like it puzzled me for a while to, uh, okay, Eckhart, he's so brilliant, uh, so bright. Like how does he let himself be so inconsistent? <laughs> uh, you know, holding that head and chair of theology at uh, the University of Paris, you know, two different terms. Uh, like he's certainly capable. Um, and then also like knowing that um, heretics <laughs> are being burned <laughs> for like saying things that he's like saying. Um, Margaret of Peretti, um, she was burned at the stake, um, you know, while Eckhart was a younger friar. The dates aren't exactly clear in my mind uh, at this moment. Um, but he, he read Margaret of Peretti. And you can see Meister Eckhart drawing uh, insights, genuine insights from her. Um, so he, he knew about her and that she you know, was burned at the stake. And so, um, you know, how, how did like, he let this happen? It was like the question that entered my mind a lot. And then to see that like he wasn't on the fringes of the Dominicans at the time, but well, well integrated, like what is he up to? Um, and just, you know, like his inconsistency, just here's a good example. As he talks about God, in one place he speaks about God as naked, unveiled being, I mean, like in a very Thomistic way, like God is not one being among other beings. Um, he's like the, the full plenitude of like the act of existence itself, not bounded by essence. Um, it's like, okay, he's very Thomistic there. Uh, but elsewhere he says, God is not being, okay, so he's already <laughs> contradicting what he said earlier, God is not being, but the highest cause of being. Then elsewhere he says, uh, well, God is actually nothing. And you, you can think about that as God is no thing, right? God is no thing. Um, he's, he's nothing in that sense. He's like nothing, this or that. He is no thing. Uh, and then elsewhere he says, uh, God is not being, but he's pure intellect, almost like pure awareness, like pure self-consciousness, or I don't know, maybe like a prefigurement of like I thou or something with Buber and personalism. So anyways, like these four kind of contradictory things to say about God and how to think about him metaphysically, it's like how did this bright thinker like, like do this, you know? Um, so that kind of disturbed me, and I wondered about that. And then this, this it kind of came together. So this, here's kind of how I think about it now. So it, it's clear that Eckhart's purpose, his main purpose in everything he says, is to draw us into like conscious, loving union with the Lord. And he wants to awaken us by like saying like surprising, startling things. Um, and like insights like this, like we do find helpful. Like, you know, think about the first time you heard that uh, God is closer to you than you are to yourself. Like, there's something that opens up. <laughs> like when you hear that, when you think about that, especially for the first time, God is closer to me than myself. I remember talking to a, a wife of my friend, and she went to Catholic school early on. And we were talking, and I forget what she was saying, but at some point I said, well, you know, you know God doesn't have a body. And she was like, oh, she's, I just had like a chill go through my spine. <laughs> and so like these insights, like these new, like metaphysical, like it, it is powerful and it is helpful. 
And so Eckhart is like trying to like to do that over and over again. At one point he says, you know, I'm going to say something you never heard before. <laughs> and maybe he revels like too much and that kind of thing. But he is like trying to awaken us to the reality of how close God is. How simple union with him is to achieve. He's really like building up our faith and hope. And I do really think like he lives out his own teaching. That we should like be so simple, indifferent of like what happens to us. And so I, I see him as like moment to moment. He's using all his language, even this metaphysical language, for the purpose of drawing us into a deeper conscious awareness and union, loving union with the Lord. You know, Catherine of Siena uses the same thing. You know, God says to her, I am he who is, you are she who is not. Not quite true metaphysically. You know, the creature is not nothing. But it's helpful to hear that, and it does help us in our union with the Lord. So Eckhart's like doing a similar thing. Even his metaphysical language is for the sake of drawing us into that awakened, conscious, union, loving union with the Lord. And I do think that he doesn't care what's going to happen. So he's not thinking, oh no, if I say this, I might be burned at the stake. But he's living his own teaching, complete detachment. I'm doing what I think the Lord is moving me to do. And he's just very childlike. And he's just saying like what he's intuiting at the moment. And then like next sermon, he's intuiting a little something different about God. And so he's not like worried about like lining things up, making a system out of it. Uh, he's a mystic. And he's trying to draw us into that, that mystical union, that living kind of awareness of, of the Lord. And he's speaking from that very childlike, surrendered, detached uh, place, rooted in God and prayer, rooted in the eternal God. And I think we should read him more as a poet sometimes than a metaphysician. But to appreciate that even poets, they're helpful in the spiritual life. Finally, and uh, just two more minutes, I promise. Um, yeah, so he's chosen the way of mystical theology over speculative theology, or scholastic theology. You know, Reginald Gerger Lagrange, at the beginning of the second volume of the Three Ages of the Spiritual Life, he raises the question, which is loftier, the language of systematic theology or the language of the mystics? And surprisingly, Gerger Lagrange... Uh, that uh, Thomas of the Strict Observance, Gergely Iran says the loftier of the two languages is the language of the mystics. I would have expected him to say the language of systematic theology is loftier, and oh yeah, the mystics use po poetry to kind of help simple people kind of access this thing. But no, he says there are times where the, the language of the mystics is the loftier discourse, he says, because it flows from a higher knowledge, infused contemplation. And he says the benefit of systematic theology is that it's more clear. Mystical language is, is obscure. Right? And Eckhart says one place, everything he said has a quasi in front of it. <laughs> like, so to speak. He says that everything I've said is, is quasi. <laughs> um, and so, um, so John the Cross, let me just read, read this to end with him. Those of us in sacrament, just so you have this background when we hear his language and his reflections, how to take it and what he's up to. So, John of the Cross, as he writes an introduction to his spiritual canticle and he dedicates the work to Mother Ana de Jesus, he speaks of his 40 stanzas of poetry as mystical theology. And he means by that uh, a loving infusion of God's uh, light into his soul. Uh, and then he said, and he distinguishes that, and then he sees his commentary on those 40 stanzas as using speculative or scholastic theology. So he says to Mother Ana de Jesus, even though your reverence lacks training in scholastic theology, through which the divine truths are understood, right, that's the goal, that's the purpose of the science of scholastic speculative theology, to understand the divine truths to the extent that we can, right? Uh, so he says, although you lack scholastic theology, you are not wanting in mystical theology, which is known through love and by which these truths are not only known, but at the same time enjoyed. 
Right? So mystical theology is a knowing that, that builds on loving and a savoring, a tasting of these truths. Mystical wisdom, the gift of the Holy Spirit of wisdom gives us a, a, a savor, a taste of God. And mystical theology, like his poetry, is ordered towards leading us to taste the truths of God as well. And then uh, John the Cross opens up how mystical language is higher at times than speculative scholastic theology. And it goes like this. The wisdom and charity of God is so vast, as the Book of Wisdom states, that it reads from end to end, and the soul informed and moved by it bears in some way this abundance and impulsiveness in her words. The Spirit of the Lord who abides in us and aids our weakness, as St. Paul says, pleads for us with unspeakable groanings in order to manifest what we can neither fully understand nor comprehend. As a result, these persons let something of their experience overflow in figures, comparisons, and similitudes. And from the abundance of their spirit, pour out secrets and mysteries rather than rational explanations. And this is what we'll hear Meister Eckhart do.
Holy Spirit, we ask you to take us by the hand and teach us how to seek you in all things. Enliven us, Holy Spirit, in our seeking Christ in all things. Teach us how to do that. Let's live by faith. So this is from uh, Meister Eckhart's Talk of Instruction. And this is a little later in number six. This real possession of God is to be found in the heart. In an inner motion of the spirit towards him and striving for him. And not just in thinking about him always in the same way. For that would be beyond the capacity of our nature. It would be very difficult to achieve. It would not even be the best thing to do. We should not content ourselves with the God of thoughts. For when the thoughts come into an end, so too shall God. Rather, we should have a living God, who is beyond the thoughts of all people and all creatures. That kind of God will not leave us. Whoever possesses God in their being has him in a divine manner, and he shines out to them in all things. For them, all things taste of God, and in all things it is God's image that they see. God is always radiant for them. They are inwardly detached from the world and are informed by the loving presence of their God. It is the same as when someone has a great thirst. And although they may be doing something other than drinking, and their minds may be turned to other things, the thought of a drink will not leave them for as long as they thirst. Whatever they do, whoever they are with, whatever they strive for, whatever their works or thoughts, and the greater their thirst, the greater, the more intense, immediate, and persistent the thought of a drink becomes. Or if someone loves something passionately with all their might, so that nothing else pleases them or touches their heart, and they desire that alone and nothing else, then certainly, whoever it may be, or whoever they may be with, whatever they are doing or setting out to do, the object of their love will never be extinguished in them, but they will find its image in all things. And the greater their love becomes, the more present to them it will be. Such a person does not seek peace, for it is already theirs.
you're thirsty, uh, that thirst never leaves you. Whatever you're doing, you're always aware of it. And that thirst is experienced in different ways. You know, there's like the thirst after eating pretzels. There's a thirst after like a hard workout. There's a thirst after you're like getting over the flu or some sickness. Uh, thirst in the morning. Different qualities to the thirst. But whatever you're doing, that thirst, thirst remains with you. We want our desire for God to be like that. And to find God in that movement of the Spirit. In the depths, on the level of our faith, and on the level of our thirst. Our deeper thirst. Better think about the first time you fell in love and how the image of your beloved <laughs> you saw everywhere, <laughs> whatever you were doing, you just keep thinking about the one you're in love with. You see that image everywhere. Right? With God, we're more like that for us. I remember uh, falling in love in fifth grade. I didn't know about contemplation yet. And so I would like contemplate the school picture of <laughs> my girlfriend. <laughs> and yeah, you can see the image everywhere. And God wants to be like that for us. God wants to be like that for us. Right? And there's a way too that Eckhart will point out that we cannot but seek God. Right, any good thing that you seek, God is behind that good thing as like the ultimate horizon. Right, every particular good is set in the context of the ultimate good, God himself. Any good thing is just a small glimpse, a small drop of the infinite goodness of God himself. So anything we seek, you find God in because he's, he's behind it. He's the horizon beyond it. Eckhart loves to make this point. And it's, you know, it's very Thomistic. So I'll tell you what St. Thomas says, and then I'll show you just the strong poetic language that Eckhart uses to make the same point, to really drive it home for us. So there's this uh, Thomistic dictum, which when I first read it, just really blew me away. It's, uh, it's on the back of Andre de Lubach's book, Discovery of God. And uh, the dictum is this, in every act of thought and will, God is also thought and willed implicitly. Right? Any, anything you think, you're, you're thinking the ultimate truth implicitly. Anything you will, you're seeking the ultimate good. You're willing the ultimate good implicitly. So St. Thomas and De Veritate 22, Article 2, First Response. All knowers know God implicitly in all they know. All knowers know God implicitly in all they know. And then St. Thomas says in Summa Theologiae, Part 1, Question 44, the first question on creation. Article 4, third response. All things desire God as their end when they desire some good thing. Whether this desire be intellectual or sensible or natural. Because nothing is good and desirable except for as much as it participates in the likeness to God. I try to do this in the monastery sometimes, in the refectory. Every bite, <laughs> you know, don't go overboard, but you know, that, um, that satisfaction of eating food, there, there's a, a foretaste there of that ultimate satisfaction of resting in God in eternity. You know, especially for like the higher goods, uh, beyond food. Uh, resting in God, the beauty of a sunset. Foretaste of resting in God for eternity. We need to live in that hope, live in that place. So here's uh, how Eckhart uh, puts it. 
I have often said the following, which is a short truth, that if someone were famished to the point of death and were then offered the finest food, they would prefer to die before tasting or enjoying the food if God's likeness were not in it. And if someone were freezing to death, they could not touch or put on any kind of clothing unless God's likeness were in it. Something about like the warmth of putting on that, that extra coat in the cold. Uh, something about that is a foretaste of that final clothing with God right himself in eternity. We can find God in all these things. We cannot but see God. And so part of continual prayer is becoming aware of the ways that we are already seeking God in implicit ways and to help make it more explicit in a free act of love and a free act of gratitude and a free act of surrender and loving union with Him. Eckhart says, A man can never feel love or desire for any creature unless God's likeness were in it. Another place Eckhart says, All things become simply God for you, for in all things you notice only God. Just as a man who stares long at the sun, S-U-N, the sun in the sky, just as a man who stares long at the sun sees the sun in whatever he afterward looks at. So let's allow the Lord to show us places in our lives where we are seeking Him, maybe without realizing it. And that can mean sometimes redirecting what we're seeking a little bit, so God is the true end there. Or sometimes it's just bringing out what's already there, foretaste of the Lord, claiming it in faith, savoring God in the food you say, in gratitude and thanksgiving, savoring God in the friendship enjoy with someone as it foreshadows that perfect friendship with God in heaven. Best foretaste of God of all in this life, savoring and tasting His presence in the Eucharist. That's just a small glimmer of what communion with Him will be like in heaven.
just going to uh, run through some choice quotes from Eckhart, some space of silence between each one. This first, just a good summary from uh, St. John Paul II that captures something central about Eckhart. St. John Paul II says, Did not Eckhart teach his disciples? All that God asks you most pressingly is to go out of yourself and let God be God in you. All that God asks you most pressingly is to go out of yourself and let God be God in you. Here's a passage I used to read um, when I was a Dominican student brother uh, before Mass, preparing for Mass. Just helping me see, helping us see uh, just how much God delights to pour Himself out into our souls in Holy Communion. Right? It belongs to His nature to pour Himself out. The Father pours Himself out, giving everything to the Son except that being the Father. The Father and Son pour themselves out to the Holy Spirit, giving the Holy Spirit everything except that being the Father and the Son. And then the Trinity chooses in freedom and in love to do what they do in their inner life, to do what they do in their inner life to us. God chooses to pour himself out to our souls, and it belongs to his nature to do it. And we delight when our natures are activated, so to speak, to the full. Eckhart says, Here, God delights so much in this likeness that he finds in the human being made in his image. God delights so much in this likeness that he pours out his whole nature and being in this equality of himself. He rejoices in it, this likeness, the image of God, the image of his Son, right? The Father rejoices in us as he rejoices in his Son. He rejoices in it, this image, just as if one were to turn a horse loose in a green meadow that was entirely smooth and level, and it would be the horse's nature to let him go with all his strength, galloping through the meadow. He would enjoy it, for it's his nature. In just the same way, God finds joy and satisfaction when he finds likeness. He rejoices, pouring out all his nature and his being into his likeness. Right? God isn't just like, okay with us, or like, Fine with us, but no, and him pouring himself out into us, especially let's say in the Eucharist, he's like that horse galloping at full strength. He's doing what he is, that horse galloping, nothing more enjoyable than that level plane and just letting loose. And God finds such delight too in pouring himself out in us. We make space for him, we empty our hearts of everything else. Make space for him to receive him.
And I like the horse galloping in it because I'm a runner. And you know, not just to give me, don't give me just a level, but a slight decline. Oh man, and just to run and just let loose. I can't keep it up as long as I used to be able to, but oh yeah, it's so good, right? To uh, be fully engaged uh, and so God, yeah, like that horse galloping through the meadow. It just occurred to me that, yeah, Father, he exists pouring himself out to the Son. Father and Son exist pouring themselves out in the Holy Spirit. And what about the Holy Spirit pouring himself out? Well, he, he's especially apt to be poured out into our souls. Right, John Paul II talks a lot about this in his encyclical on the Holy Spirit, that he's Holy Spirit gift. He's especially apt because of who he is uh, as the, the, his personal properties as Holy Spirit. He's especially apt to enter into our souls, and when he enters into our souls, he brings Son and Father with him. <laughs> um, not that God needs us, of course, uh, but the Holy Spirit, as Holy Spirit gift, is especially apt to be poured out into our souls. And then when he comes, he brings Son and Father, as they pour themselves out into our souls. In dwelling Trinity, three persons, one God. Okay, okay, next one. For those of you who feel some kind of aches and pains in your old, weary body, uh, Eckhart says, my soul is as young as when she was created. In fact, much younger. And I tell you, I should be ashamed if she were not younger tomorrow than today. My soul is as young as when she was created. In fact, much younger. And I tell you, I should be ashamed if she were not younger tomorrow than today. This childlikeness, Lord. Help us to grow in this childlike disposition more and more, day after day. That newness of life, you who are beauty ever ancient, ever new, awaken us, Lord, to that newness. Rejuvenate us, Lord, with the new mercies that come from you every morning. Give us a heart of a child, Lord, more and more, day after day. In Mary's arms, in the Father's arms. My soul is as young as when she was created, in fact, much younger. And I tell you, I should be ashamed if she were not younger tomorrow than today.
much of the Old Testament doesn't want us to fall into idolatry. So Eckhart is concerned about the concepts we can have of God that limit him and kind of make of him an idol. So kind of in this spirit, he really stresses that God is above all names that we can give him. You know, the, the better way to put it is the teaching of analogy. And the Fourth Ladder Council of 1215 says, in every likeness between the creature and God, there's an ever greater uh, dissimilarity. In every similarity between the creature and God, there's an ever greater dissimilarity. So there is an infinite difference, yet our names do actually say something about God. But uh, Eckhart wants to kind of, he pushes strong in that direction. And so it's quite surprising in Sermon 5, as he's quoting on, quoting and commenting on 1 John 4.16, God is love. It's quite striking. He says this, should anyone ask what God is, this is what I should now say. Right, almost like he's changing his position a little bit. Or metaphysics alone doesn't take us far enough in knowing the true God. Should anyone ask what God is, this is what I shall now say, that God is love. So God does have a name. God is love. And in fact, so lovable that all creatures seek to love his lovableness, whether they know it or not, or whether they wish to or not. So much is God love and so lovable that everything that can love must love him, whether it will or not. Right? It's the choice of a free creature to love him freely, to back that up with a yes. And elsewhere, Eckhart says, God has no other name but love. And in this name, love, she says all names. Side of himself. He's perfectly content in himself and the fullness of his being from all eternity. <laughs> He's lived in bliss, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and enjoyment of their communion of love. You know, God doesn't need anything outside of himself. An important metaphysical truth, and it's true. But we do feel that if we do know that, if that's all we say, something is lacking a bit we take in the scriptures in divine revelation. And yes, we maintain the truth. God doesn't need the creature like I need a glass of water or like I need the sunlight or something. Uh, yet in love, he chooses <laughs> to uh, be something like a needy lover approaching us. So the mystics try to like find language for that. You know, St. Catherine of Siena, she's clear too. God doesn't need us to, like, to fulfill himself. Yet she, he's, she says God is, is a drunken lover. He's mad with love for us. 
And it's not just like, oh, that's poetry, so it doesn't, it really doesn't mean anything, or it means something less than systematic theology. Well, no. That poetic language is trying to get at a truth that's hard to express. Truth that's hard to hold together with, with, with everything else. Yet yeah, God is like a, a drunken lover, madly in love with us, running after us, as if he needs us, St. Catherine says. Unless he also recognizes uh, he's, he's content and happy himself. Right? But he's not just the high point of being. He is the God of love. He is the God of love. And since God is love, I'm not surprised it's a mystery <laughs> how it all fits together. <laughs> if love describes who God is and it is his name that contains every other name, yeah, I'm not surprised we can't connect all the dots. We shouldn't expect to. You know, Mother Teresa will say the same thing about God thirsting for us. And she's actually building on a Dionysius without knowing it. Eros. Eros is perfected in God too, a yearning. Um, Benedict XVI thinks of something he's got to prepare to assess. The Mother Teresa says, you know, Jesus' thirst on the cross reveals the thirst of God. And she says, yes, God's thirst. So there's something very mysterious. But yet, God's love for us is not just like a rational willing the good for us. It is that. But it's not just a rational, I want to choose to do good to these creatures. He's not indifferent. <laughs> And choosing to do us good. He's like a passionate lover. He's thirsting for our love. He's thirsting for our faith, as St. Augustine says. As the Catechism says, prayer is our thirst meeting God's thirst for us. Very mysterious. So Eckhart has his own way of saying this. And, you know, it's a little exaggerated, like, but it needs to be exaggerated to capture it. God is love. Now, my children, I beg you to mark my words. God loves my soul, your soul, so much that his life and being depend on his loving us. Whether he would or no, to stop God loving our souls would be to, to deprive him of his Godhead. For God is as truly love as he is truth, and as truly as he is goodness, he is love. That is the bare truth as God lives. God doesn't need us, but it is God being God. It is God fulfilling. It is God acting out of what he is and choosing to love us. So we have to, like John Paul II noted, get out of God's way and let God be God in us. Go out of self and let God be God in us. And this leads to our response of love. Eckhart likes to say, love without a why, without a W-H-Y, without a reason. Don't love to try to get something from the other. Don't love to try to accomplish something. Love because it's who you are. It's what you are. You know, we should seek for great things, you know. We do these midday retreat with the mystics. My aspiration was to convert New York City and make everyone in the city mystics and to fill this, this church. <laughs> and it's okay, right? right? It's okay to, to have uh, great aspirations, magnanimous, great soulness, seeking great things for the Lord. Uh, it's okay for that. But on the other hand, you know, it's also love without a why. Let's do what we're doing today, not because of some great benefit, but because it's because of who we are. It's what we're about. It's what we're doing. Whether hundreds come or two come, or the nice crowd we have today, we love without a why. In your relationships with others, if you don't love without a why, you love sometimes and you get mad because the other person doesn't return the love. Right? Or they misunderstand it. You meant it to be this, this thing to help the person, they misunderstand it, so you're hurt. Okay, no, that, that's human. You know, there's something fine about that. But to love without a why. Love because it's who you are. St. Bernard says in a sermon, I love because I love. I love so that I may love. Love is its own end. 
St. Lord the Porus says, love is never wasted because the good always diffuses itself. No act of love is wasted. But do not even think about whether it's wasted or not. Love without a why. Love because it's who you are. There's a philosophy for ministry here. Do what you're about and invite other people to join you. Do what springs up in your heart as a response to God and his love and invite others to join you. And Meister Eckhart says this is what life is. Life is this self-movement, right? A dead thing doesn't move itself from an interior principle. A living thing does. Aristotle calls living beings that. They, they live from self-movement. We make choices and move ourselves. And so Eckhart says we live in him. We live in God, with God. And we desire nothing more than life. And what is life? That which is moved from within, by itself. What is moved from without is not alive. So if we live with God, we must cooperate with him from within. So that we do not work from without, we must be moved from that out of which we live, from within, living by him. We can and must work with this power from within. All right, so to find, find that sweet spot of freedom in the Holy Spirit, where you love and what you do comes from that place of freedom in the Holy Spirit, not of a freedom for lawlessness, a disciplined love, but something that flows forth in spontaneity, freedom from that inner stream of water flowing up from your heart. That's that place of loving without a why. And that's often when we most cooperate with God and His love, since He loves too without a why. Okay, just one more quote before I have some silence. Yeah. Eckhart, you know, pondering about the indwelling trinity in our souls, we can take this line, speaking to us today. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit dwells, dwell in our souls as in a temple through grace. Eckhart notes that those who are not turned to interior things are like those who have wine in the cellar but have never tasted it. Right? We have wine in the cellar, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, our delight, our beatitude, heaven and faith. We have wine in the cellar, and if we're not turned within, seeking God there, and faith, open charity, if we're not turned within, seeking God there, I like people who have wine in the cellar, but have never tasted it. We turn within and seek the Lord, faith, hope, and love, very subtly, very delicately, and taste the wine of love. Those who are not turned to interior things are like those who have wine in the cellar but have never tasted it. One thing to cap that off. Living from that interior spontaneity of the Holy Spirit, cooperating with God, with that living water springing forth, that loving without a why, is where we most cooperate with God. And from that interior place, that's where the Father begets the Son from all eternity. And we get a share in that begetting, in our adoption. And so the fruitfulness with which the Father engenders the Son from all eternity, we get a share in the more that our efforts spring forth from that interior place where the Father begets the Son as if anew. Right? It's, it's the eternal now. It's as if the, the curtain on the stage is just opening, as if for the first time it's ever new, ever fresh, the Father begetting the Son. And all that fruitfulness, vitality, power, is in our souls, and we get a share in it when we draw forth from that inner life of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for love of the world.
hard deadline of finishing benediction uh, by three o'clock here on out. So uh, freedom of the spirit, uh, but within the bonds of, of law as well. So, <laughs> um, yeah, you know, wanting to fill this church, to turn, to help every New Yorker uh, enter the mystical union with God, right? It's noble aspirations, things like that, and our efforts we do. Uh, there's something good about that, right? But how can, like, egotism <laughs> uh, not be, like, part of that, right? How, how can that be, like, really free of egotism? And maybe, I mean, that's okay, I mean, right? If gold is mixed with the lesser metal, it's still gold. It's not pure gold, it's still gold. And, okay, maybe we don't have pure love entirely, right, until heaven. So, okay, nothing wrong with that, but... Um, yeah, you know, these good things you want to do for the, the Lord, these great things. Yeah, it's hard for the egotism not to be involved. And that's where loving without a why comes in. Loving from that place of spontaneity. From a disciplined life. Bearing fruits of the Spirit, right? The tree that bears fruit is not like straining. It, it's, what it's, it's doing what it does. It's doing what it is. Uh, and doing it for the Lord and love of Him. Um, and so we will end with here something that builds on this. And this is the Master's final words. So the, these are the last words of Meister Eckhart and what he wants for his disciples, what he wants for us. And yeah, it rings, it rings true like a good way of like summarizing his message and what he wants for us um, and what he's about. And it's good for us. Uh, to hear this, and we'll hear and hear, you know, something of the little way of St. Therese. You know, don't just seek God in the big things. Seek Him in the little things. He's in, as much, he's in the small things as much as the big things. Don't seek God just in one mode. Otherwise, you're seeking the mode more than you're seeking God. Seek God in whatever position, whatever situation He has placed you in this moment, big or small. And the small things are just as important. Meister Eckhart was besought by his good friends. Give us something to remember, since you are going to leave us. He said, I will give you a rule, which is the keystone of all that I have ever said, which comprises all truth that can be spoken of or lived. It often happens that what seems trivial to us is greater in God's sight than what looms large in our eyes. Therefore, we should accept all things equally from God, not ever looking and wondering which is greater or higher or better. We should just follow where God points out for us, that is, what we are inclined to, what we are inclined to in the Spirit, and to which we are most often directed, and where our bent is. If a man were to follow that path, God would give him the most and the least, and would not fail him. It often happens that people spurn the least, and thus they prevent themselves from getting the most and the least, which is wrong. God is in all modes, and equal in all modes, for him who can take him equal. People often wonder whether their inclinations come from God or not. This is how to find out. If a man finds it within himself to be willing above all things to obey God's will in all things, provided he knew or recognized it, then he may know that whatever he's inclined to or is most frequently directed to in the depths of his soul is indeed from God. Some people want to find God as he shines before them or as he tastes to them. They find the light and the taste, but they do not find God. <laughs> Some people want to find God as he shines before them or as he tastes to them, and their preferences, right? But they find the light and the taste, but they do not find God. A scripture declares that God shines in the darkness, where we sometimes least recognize him. Where God shines least for us is often where he shines the most. Therefore, we should accept God equally in all ways and in all things. 
Now someone might say, I would take God equally in all ways and in all things, but my mind will not abide in this way or that, so much as in another. To that I say, he's wrong. God is in all ways and equal in all ways for anyone who can take him so. If you get more of God in one way than another, that's fine, but it is not the best. God is in all ways and equal in all ways for anyone who can take him so. If you take one way such and such, that is not God. If you take this and that, you are not taking God, for God is all in all, in all ways and equal in all ways for anyone who can take himself. Now someone might say, but if I take God equally in all ways and in all things, do I do still need some special way? Do I not still need some special way? Now see, in whatever way you find God most, and you are most often aware of him, that is the way you should follow. But if another way presents itself quite contrary to the first, and that having abandoned the first way, you find God as much in the new way as in the one you had left, then that is right. But the noblest and best thing would be this. If a man were come to such equality with such calm and certainty that he could find God and enjoy him in any way and in all things, without having to wait for anything or chase after anything, that would delight me. For this, and to this end, all works are done, and every work helps toward this. If anything does not help toward this, you should let it go. We thank thee, Heavenly Father, that thou hast given us thy only begotten Son, and whom you have given yourself and all things. We pray, you Heavenly Father, for the sake of thy only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom, though neither wilt nor canst deny anything to anyone, hear us in him, and make us free and bear of all our manifold thoughts, and unite us in him with you. Amen. Blessed be God, blessed be Jesus, holy name, blessed be Jesus Christ, true God, and true man.
Yeah.